now. Okay. So recording uh, so, uh, in progress. So I. So you I. Hello. Yeah, so I, good. Can hear yeah, I would request everybody uh, for the time of our disc to uh, mute their speakers so that there would be uninterrupted discussion and uh, people should be uh, getting all the ideas what we are discussing rather than there would be any dis like no disturbance in between. The second point what I want to highlight just to add with Dr. Sanan, the marking, the passing is almost you would say uh, there are candidates there are uh, experiences from our own academy also people have been unsuccessful with just 0.5 marks and that's the reason from this time onwards they are not sharing the total marks they are just saying you have cleared it or not because there were so many queries to the european uh, society the edic exam uh, forum that uh, why the 0.5 mark you are not considering. So I would request everybody that the, uh, the battle is really fierce and uh, you have to be on your toes. It, it cannot be like taken granted that yes, I have scored this much of marks in my training period. So it's another exam. I would be also clicking it no because the format is really like every year they're changing the format. And that's the reason why we have also changed our format this time. We have made it more of like a clinical bedside and little bit of difficult. We have increased the difficulty level to the next, I would say, compared with our two to three last, uh, like the classes, what we had in uh, last three months. So that's uh, why we want to prepare you before so that in the real exam, you won't feel the heat. So that's that's the experience from our all mentors as well as our examiners. That yes, the label is right now really really very hard for the edit part. And in the uh, like the same time, I would say I'm not going to like no demotivate or like not uh, make you scared. But yes, you have to prepare well so that it's better to sweat in peace rather than bleed in war. So that's the like uh, the statement which holds true for edit part. Dr. Sanant, uh, I would request you to uh, take the track of all the queries in the chat box because I am sharing the screen for the time being. And also, if there are any queries, I would like request you to first uh, try addressing. And along with, I would request my mentors, Dr. K. R. Ramanathan from Singapore and Dr. Susruta Bandhapada from Kolkata. They are the expert in the cardiac critical care. They have vast experience for last, I think, uh, 20 to 25 years so definitely would be benefited as faculties we would be also benefited by their own experience and their expertise and don't hesitate to post your queries in the chat box we would be trying to solve all those queries during the discussion itself but if there are any more like queries we would be also putting uh, the answer articles the references in our dedicated whatsapp group for edit part two, which we have already started, and there are many candidates who have been like registered in that. So we are just waiting for two to three minutes so that people like uh, who have started opening or like uh, logging in, we are giving just two to three minutes of time and then we will be uh, starting with the CCS. So, Dr. Sanand, uh, if you allow me, uh, I can start the process. Dr. Ramanathan has messaged me that uh, please get started. I am on time. I will join. No, we should start the process. We are already yeah, yeah. five minutes past. So. Yes, yes, yes. So, without uh, wasting further time, I welcome again 
all of you all the uh, the edict part 2 part 1 aspirants there are many candidates who have uh, been like uh, practicing there are many candidates who have started the preparation for edict part 1 and now this course this uh, debrief is open to the candidates uh, from different places other than india as well as uh, from uae from uk it's live in the Anastasia TV, which is having almost 35,000 subscribers and uh, many students from different countries right now logged in. So we are happy to have all of them here. And these, uh, the cardiology and cardiac surgical critical care, the module has started eight days before. So we have prepared one set of CCS, which comprises of two CCS questions one from the cardiology and the second one is from cardiac surgical critical care. And there are almost 25 CPS questions that is computer-based scenarios. So the candidates have already attempted those who have uh, been registered in our course, but for the sake of uh, all the candidates who are not registered, but they want to get the experience of edit part two exam, how the examination normally happens, how the discussion happens, what were the questions, what is the format of the answers, how you should speak in the exam. So all these things for that, we have decided to make it free for everybody. And uh, we are having the discussion today. And I welcome Dr. Sanand Kumar Das again, who is the course co-director and my two men for today's discussion. Very learned Dr. K. R. Ramanathan, who is the, uh, the, uh, the chief of cardiac critical care as well as the program director, the fellowship director of uh, National University Hospital, Singapore. He has vast experience in cardiac critical care and he's also very active in ELSO. And he's also having so many publications about ECMO. So he would be joining at any point of time because he's uh, having his hospital on duty, but uh, still he's from Singapore will be joining and he would be definitely sharing his experience with us. And with us also today, Dr. Susruta Bandhapadhyay, who is the Director of Critical Care, Amri Hospital, Salt Lake, Kolkata. Very vast experience in the cardiac critical care and uh, uh, big expert in the echocardiogram. So without uh, wasting further time, the CCS first one would be discussed by me and then Dr. Sananta Das would be discussing the CCS part two. And I would request everybody, whoever is having any queries, please post in the chat box. So let's start with the CCS clinical vignette one. The questions would be coming like this. You would be given five minutes time before you would be appearing the real exam in the edit part two. So the first clinical vignette with, with you, they would be sharing with you five minutes before the exam. Now, in our today's discussion, you attend an emergency call in your hospital's acute medical unit during the Please share your screen for that. Yeah. The screen uh, you cannot see? Okay. No. Not yet. Okay. Please share your screen. Okay. Now it is visible? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So the first uh, CCS is about cardiology and uh, see how the questions from the CCS vignette one, two, it would change to other domains. And so that's the beauty of our discussion. We would be giving you the real experience of the edit part two. So the first clinical vignette one, the question starts like this, and this would be also your exam paper. So believe that you are now appearing the edict part two and the examiner is in front of you and I am the examiner and I am sharing this uh, clinical scenario with you five minutes before your question answer session starts. You attend an emergency call in your hospital's acute medical unit during daytime hours. On arrival at the spot, a 34-year-old female, Mrs. XYZ, appears tachypneic respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute with saturation 96% on 15 liter per minute oxygen therapy. She is tachycardic 110 beats per minute with pressure of 120 by 70 millimeter mercury. She is febrile with a temperature of 38 degrees centigrade. XYZ is alert 
and able to answer questions appropriately but finds it difficult to complete sentences due to breathing difficulties she also complains of left sided chest pain that came on abruptly which is affecting her ability to take deep breaths and there is also a swollen left calf that is painful on palpation measures to stabilize xyz have already been initiated now i would be starting with two three important points from this wignet one first of all these are all real case scenarios from the european icus the second point they would not be discussing about uh, some historical or something which are not very uh, you can say practical so as we dissect further before going into the questions that have been shared to the candidates two days before let's scan and keep in mind so the clues to how you should approach the real exam i have made little bit of changes here so once you get these scenarios in your like no laptop or your desktop screen rather than going into all those 10 lines you have to scan few things which are relevant to your like the discussion and as uh, responsible and attendings who are practicing real critical care we expect as examiners that you should scan the important uh, like messages what the examiner wants to convey to you so here if i would dissect and scan 34 year female acute medical unit tachypneic saturation 96% and 15 liter per minute oxygen tachycardic blood pressure is 120 by 70 which not very alarming right now but she is febrile consciousness is okay but there is also complain of left sided chest pain and most important for me as i am uh, like practicing critical care for last 4 5 years and i am practicing to clear my edic part 2 so the examiner expect that you should read the most important line or two from the clinical case vignette 1 so here i would find swollen left calf that is painful on palpation to be the most striking so this is the scan and you should do for every clinical vignette you get in your laptop or your screen your desktop now the questions would come straight after you see and like no go through in 2 to 3 minutes and the first question would be what could be the most likely causes of deterioration in this case so the questions would be straight forward differential diagnosis or what is in your mind diagnosis something like this it won't be like what would be the percentage of like you no know, the cases what would be the like the clinical features no it would be more of clinical and when you answer we would suggest you to have a structure in your mind rather than going from like uh, like here and then entering into something else and then trying to like cover everything but no flow so the examiner don't find it interesting to like read or like uh, the uh, understand if you are so haphazard in your answer so that's why always in our academy in our debriefs we expect our candidates to go through one structure so here if i would be asked this question so i would first start with the respiratory because the respiratory is the striking thing for me right now and the first thing what would be coming in my mind pulmonary embolism and it won't be the 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 uh, straight forward answer rather i would also add from respiratory system pneumonia acute asthma exacerbation i don't know the exact history spontaneous pneumothorax because it has happened very acutely and there is also left sided chest pain so maybe or uh, these would be my differential diagnosis from the respiratory domain now coming to the cardiovascular this uh, the striking things that would come in my mind is acute pulmonary edema acute myocardial infarction and aortic dissection so these three things would be in the cardiovascular others in others chest pain sudden deterioration febrile respiratory distress so maybe there would be some uh, like differential diagnosis would come from the gastrointestinal corporated viscous acute pancreatitis but the answers if the examiner would be there in the edic part 2 they would be any possible cause 
but must include pulmonary embolism and acute pulmonary edema. So if you start from like uh, aortic dissection, then acute myocardial infarction, but pulmonary embolism, you will forget. Maybe they will not give you a single mark. So it's, it's doubtful. So there would be also, if there are four marks, you would get, like you expect that, yes, I have uttered the word aortic dissection, myocardial infarction, but somehow forgot to utter the pulmonary embolism. But the examiner may be very strict in not giving you a single mark because all pulmonary embolism you should not miss because your diagnosis and your management are like you if you diagnose well then will your management will follow if you will not diagnose that pulmonary embolism is your first differential diagnosis definitely the next things will not come into your mind now what is the most probable diagnosis in this case? It's a straightforward question. So if you do not know, now you would be in confusion. And the answers would be like your like marks may be acute pulmonary embolism. They may give you a four marks straight. One answer here. What is the most probable diagnosis in this case? Now, the, the third question would be, how do we define hemodynamic instability? in acute high-risk pulmonary embolism. The question straightforward ask you how you divide the hemodynamic instability if you are suspecting that C is a high-risk pulmonary embolism. So it's a clear definition. It is a clear classification. So you have to start with maybe the patient will present with cardiac arrest. Maybe the patient will present with obstructive shock and the obstructive shock here would be systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeter mercury or vasopressors required to achieve a systolic blood pressure 90 millimeter mercury despite whatever you have done for the fluid resuscitation and you are still getting evidence of end organ perfusion. So that is the obstructive shock in a case of high risk pulmonary embolism. And third one is persistent hypotension. And in that, the systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeter mercury or systolic blood pressure fall or decrease 40 millimeter mercury that lasts longer than 15 minutes and is not caused by the other confounding factors like new onset arrhythmia, hypovolemia or sepsis. So this would be the, you would say, definition of hemodynamic instability in acute high-risk pulmonary embolism. So this would be the uh, third question. Now, there would be another question the examiner would like to ask. What are the risk factors that increase your risk for VTE? In that, CE is pointing towards there is pain in the lower calf. So definitely there was, uh, there is suspicion of venous thromboembolism. So the questions you have to answer in again, certain headings. It cannot be... Uh, mechanical ventilation, age, obesity. So it would be confusing and you will like miss many important uh, etiology if you will not follow certain structure. So in this case, I would be dividing my answer into genetic risk factors, acquired risk factors, ICU related risk factors. In genetic risk factors, protein C and S deficiency, antithrombin 3 deficiency, factor 5 laden mutation. So maybe she is a 34 year female, again, in the childbearing age group, she may present with the acute pulmonary embolism with the background history of anti like phospholipid syndrome. So that could be. So in that genetic risk factor plays a very important role. Now, coming to the acquired risk factors, age, obesity, previous venous thromboembolism, history of malignancy or having current malignancy, vasculitis, pregnancy. Hormone replacement therapy, OCP. So everything falls into this, like uh, this patient's history because the presentation also, maybe she is taking something like this or maybe she is uh, like having pregnancy. We don't know. So in case the examiner wants to know that whether you are trying to like uh, uh, divide your answers into proper like risk factors, then uh, definitely you will fetch 100% marks. Now, ICU related risk factors, if the patient is in ICU, we normally deal with this type of patients day in and day out. So in this prolonged immobility, for example, mechanical ventilation, paralysis, sedative drugs, femoral venous catheters, inappropriate dosage or lack of thromboprophylaxis. So in this, 
you can divide your like risk factors for the VTE into three parts and the answers are right now here. So in case you answer like one or two important points from all these three points, you will get 100% marks and the marking happens here. So uh, there is normally like one examiner who will be with one uh, iPad and depending upon your answers, you would be ticking and every answer would be having one or two marks. Now. The next question which we do at the bedside immediately, what role does echocardiography have in the workup for diagnosing PE? Again, the answers are very straightforward because we do uh, every day and the, uh, the examining is expected to show his ex like the, the expertise in performing bedside focus for ruling out or ruling in pulmonary embolism. So that's why the question is framed like this. So in this question, I would again divide into two parts. Echocardiography, role, diagnostic modality, management decision. In diagnostic modality, the answer would be again divided into rapid bedside assessment in a hemodynamically unstable patient where I am not getting the scope to perform or the patient for CTPA, which is the gold standard for ruling in your pulmonary embolism. Now, CTPA is CT pulmonary angiogram. Now, there is also another diagnostic modality here that coexisting other cardiac abnormality along with pulmonary embolism. If there is also suspicion of some amount of LV dysfunction, valvular abnormalities such as TR in uh, the acute pulmonary embolism scenario, pulmonary pressure, volume status. Because everything, if you are doing right now with the ultrasound or echo here, that would be having some or other like effect on the final management. Now, coming to the management discussion, existence of right ventricular dysfunction on echocardiography is a criteria to think seriously about thrombolysis because that is one of the prognostic indicator for the uh, recovery as well as the, the morbidity, mortality of acute pulmonary embolism treatment. So if your patient is having right ventricular dysfunction, definitely 60% chance this patient would deteriorate further. But if the patient is still not having a right ventricular dysfunction, maybe there is chance of 10 to 15% of uh, like no severity. Now, questions again, if we are discussing about echocardiography, the next question would be, what are the features on the 2D echo to suggest the diagnosis of PE? Now, in this, we normally tend to have one or two points, but you have to remember the most important things along with the RARB dilatation. People start talking about RARB dilatation and McKinnell sign, but these are not the only things that you should know or understand. So here, if the question would be the 2D echo finding of pulmonary embolism. So it would start with decreased right ventricular, regional and longitudinal function, increased right ventricular size, Believe me, it's found only in 25% of patients. Tricuspid regurgitation, abnormal septal wall motion, that would indicate right ventricular pressure overload. McConnell sign, this is where we all know right ventricular mid, free wall becomes dyskinetic, but the apex and the base would be somehow spared. So relative sparing of the apex and base, McConnell sign. Now, if you are getting mobile thrombus located in the right ventricular uh, heart, right heart cavities, so it's a, a telltale sign of like you no know, severity of your acute pulmonary embolism, and that is associated with high mortality. Distended non-collapsible IVC, we all do it, we all know, but in examination, we also have to tell along with the findings of the cardiac echo. And the final thing, 60 by 60 sign, I would be showing you the picture. How does 60 by 60 sign normally like it's calculated? So it's a, like a simultaneous finding of right ventricular systolic pressure as well as pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Both have to be 60 like a millimeter mercury. Now you are getting your right ventricular acceleration time less than 60 millisecond with your uh, the pulmonary uh, the right ventricular systolic pressure less than 60 millimeter, and that you would be calculating from the TR jet velocity. So how does it look like? I'm just showing it for your like understanding. This is a 60 by 60 sign of uh, pulmonary embolism. So it consists of two things. The first one would be 
right ventricular systolic pressure and right ventricular systolic pressure consists of two things again one is your tg that is tricuspid gradient and the second one is right atrial pressure the uh, tricuspid rigor strength you have to calculate by this like you have to do with the proper like transthoracic echo and right atrial pressure you have to like measure the ibc if it is more than 2.1 cm or less than 2.1 cm you have to also measure the collapsibility whether it is less than 50% or more than 50% based on the permutation combination you will get the right atrial pressure so if your right atrial pressure is 15 mm mercury how it will be calculated you will get your ibc measurement more than 2.1 cm and the collapsibility is less than 50% so in that it would be the maximum that is 15 mm mercury right atrial pressure so that would be added with the tricuspid gradient which is 4 into tr max whole square so if it is less than 60 mm mercury that suggests your acute pulmonary embolism now the second point would be pulmonary acceleration time so if it is less than 60 millisecond it suggests your acute pulmonary embolism so just remember for the sake of your like if somebody is preparing for ad part 1 so again they may be asked if, like mcq 60 by 60 sign and in your like ad part 2 also they may ask you what do you mean by 60 by 60 sign and these are like in short if you want to remember as a like in a pictorial way so you start from here right heart mobile thrombus it will look like this dilated rv again it has to be the ratio the basal rv and lv ratio more than 1 enlarged rv the plaques view, we all know, we all do it at the bedside. In M board, you will get large non-collapsible non IVC here. Then in the parasternal short axis view, you will get D-shaped septum in the systole. Right ventricle takes more like uh, the ratio than the left ventricle. Here I have told about the 60 by 60 sign. Also, you will get decreased tapsy in the M mode and decreased peak S dash velocity of tricuspid ambulance. Just for the sake of getting into detail of the transthoracic and transphagial uh, esophageal echocardiography finding in acute pulmonary embolism. Now, there are certain things you may be asked in your like you know, clinical case vignettes. Here, I have just trying to summarize everything. They may ask you what are the other blood tests that could aid in diagnosing your pulmonary embolism. So in that we all know hypoxemia, increased A, A gradient, which is alveolar arterial gradient, but these are only present in, I think like almost 60% patients here, it is like you will say 24% uh, of patients, the PaO2 is normal because only we say that hypoxemia has to be there. No, PaO2 is normal in approximately 14 to 24% of patients. Third point, decrease carbon dioxide level if the patient is tachypneic. So in case like you won't get always the increased arterial carbon dioxide, but you will mostly get decreased carbon dioxide or PCO2 of like you will get the respiratory alkalosis in almost 40% of patients because of the tachypnea. But there would be also instances you will get increased arterial carbon dioxide, in which case large pulmonary embolism due to increased dead space. So just for the sake of uh, completion, you should remember what are the blood tests in the uh, ABG findings you should remember. Now, serum D-dimer level, we all know if you are not getting serum D-dimer to be high, maybe additional diagnostic testing is not necessary. Uh, it is not, as per the literature, it is not recognized that, it is recognized that the frequency of venous thromboembolism is not increased in subsequent three months. Coming to the cardiac biomarkers, troponin I and troponin T, levels are elevated in 30 to 60 percent of patients only but if you are getting elevated troponin concentration they would be indirectly or directly hinting towards increased risk of mortality in both like uh, unselected patients as well as hemodynamic stable patients at presentation so you have to have a like uh, serial troponin uh, in those patients to know whether the patient is deteriorating further or not now high sensitive troponin t assay have a high negative predictive value for excluding adverse in hospital clinical outcome now coming to the b type for uh, natriuretic peptide that is bnp or nt pro bnp so they also reflect the severity of rv dysfunction and hemodynamic compromise in acute pe so you need to also read about these cardiac biomarkers not only in acute mi rather in pulmonary embolism now, 
I think we are finished with the CCS one. The most important questions that can be asked also I have added so that you would be understanding the concept of pulmonary input. Dr. Sanand, at this point, any questions? No, Tapas. I think you have explained the things pretty uh, well. Yeah. Um, you continue with the CCS. Yeah. So uh, coming to the clinical case scenario, Vignet 2. So in real exam, you won't get much time for the clinical Vignet 2. In uh, Vignet 1, you would get at least 5 minutes of time. So you have to be in hurry. So at this point of time, XYZ begins to deteriorate further. She appears drowsy. She now has a sustained hypotension 80 by 40 millimeter mercury. We expected that the question will not come straightforward like so you have started with fluid boluses over the past 20 minutes, but the BP is dipping further. Now you did the focused echocardiography at this point of time and you found there is dilated right ventricle with impaired systolic function and her arterial blood gas at this point of time, pH of 7, PaO to 6 kilopascal, PaCO to 11 kilopascal, bicarbonate 11 millimole per liter, lactate 7.4 millimole per liter potassium 5.1 millimole per liter. The chest radiograph immediately done, which showed almost normal and she was immediately shifted to medical ICU. Now, at this point of time, uh, before going into the further questions, I would be adding few things for the examinees. Now, there is a little bit twist here. We are more familiar with the millimeter mercury, but in examination, you have to know all the conversion factors which are important for the uh, bedside practice. So I have already told you don't have time to scan much here. You have to know what is happening and remember the conversion factors from uh, the kilopascal to millimeter mercury and millimole per liter to milligram per deciliter. So you cannot ask them that please provide me the uh, conversion factor. So they expect that the, uh, the blood gas then the, uh, the electrolytes, urea creatinine, all these things, important bedside, like whatever we do regularly, you should know the conversion factors. Now, coming to the clinical scenario questions. What are your immediate concerns after shifting to ICU? So the patient was shifted to medical ICU. So the answer would be, for me, at this point of time, I have to think about intubation and protecting the airway and the gas exchange. Mechanical ven ventilation, I have to put the patient on mechanical ventilation. I have to go ahead aggressively with hemodynamic stabilization with titrated fluid and vasopressor. Believe me, rather telling about that I would start, I will do echocardiography, then I would see, I would watch on the lactate. Rather like expanding your answers and taking much of your time, you can just finish everything and the examiner would get to know that yes, this candidate knows everything. Hemodynamic stabilization with titrated. So this word is enough for the examiner to understand what do you mean by titrated fluid and titrated vasopressor. Now, advanced hemodynamic monitoring. That again, like you know, three words, but it says a lot. Advanced hemodynamic monitoring is not only about APG or your like simple ECG or like SPO. So you have to think about at this point of time, I would put atrial line, I would think about IABP, I would think about something else. So this would be rather telling about A to Z, I would be only tell about advanced hemodynamic monitoring. Now, plan for definitive management. Everybody will agree with me that in acute pulmonary embolism, patient is sinking in front of me, I have to think about the diagnosis. Also simultaneously, I have to think about the stabilization. It has to go hand in hand. So in this case also, you have to also right now at this point of time, think about the definitive management. In definitive management, you have to again divide into, I have to divide into which type of uh, like no pulmonary embolism I am treating, risk stratification and also the suitability for the thrombolysis or catheter directed therapy or only anticoagulation. So here, Definitely the examiner would know that, yes, you know about the contraindications of thrombolysis also. You know about the time spent or like time has already lost in your like no diagnosis, whether the patient would be the right candidate for thrombolysis or embolectomy or only anticoagulation. So the answers has to be very short and crisp. Rather than taking much of the time, you have to only tell about the points 
and you will fetch almost 90 to 100 percent of marks. Now, the next question, which ECG abnormalities are associated with poor prognosis in patients diagnosed with pulmonary embolism? So it's a straightforward question. We all know. So we won't take much of our time. Tachycardia more than 100 beats per minute. Mu one complete RBBB. Atrial arrhythmias, for example, atrial fibrillation. ST elevation in AVR. S1, Q3, T3. Anterior ST segment changes and T wave inversion. So these are the ECG abnormalities. If you tell about three to four, you will get 100% mark. What is the rationale for ordering a chest radiograph? So the examiner wants to know whether you are taking chest radiograph so seriously or you are not taking into account chest radiograph. So the point number one, I would be doing it to investigate for some other causes for this type of presentation. And this chest x-ray would appear normal in up to one fifth of patients. So 20% of patients, the chest x-ray would be absolutely normal. So this would like finish my clinical case scenario with net two. Now, I have added a few things just for the sake of completion. Which electrocardiograph uh, like abnormalities might be found in pulmonary embolism? So, we all know non-specific findings is the answer. Non-specific findings and up to 70% they present with the tachycardia, sinus tachycardia and non-specific ST segment changes or T wave changes. The classic S1, Q3, T3 pattern and new incomplete RBBB occur in only less than 10% of patients. So you should not take it so seriously. Now, let's go to the clinical case scenario, Vignet 3. Now you have intubated the patient perfectly. You are very good at that. Now this patient XYZ is placed on mechanical ventilation with aim of avoiding high plateau pressure. Central line is sighted. Noradrenaline infusion rapidly rises to 0.6 microgram per kg per minute. After 30 minutes following the intubation, her BP remains low at 85 by 40 millimeter mercury. Saturation is 90 to 92% on FIO2 of 1. She is now more tachycardic at 130 beats per minute. Now, you did one more clinical examination and bedside lung ultrasound to rule out any other thing that, that has happened post central line to rule out pneumothorax. Urgent CTPA has been done with due risk explanation to the family as well as to the clinical team that revealed massive PE with evidence of RV dysfunction. So here we are coming to straightforward to the final diagnosis we have, which we have talked in the first CCS clinical vignette one. Now, the question would come from the examiner now. You don't have time much. What are your main treatment priorities at this point? So the answer would be thrombolysis or embolectomy. So the greatest benefit is seen when thrombolysis is given within 48 hours of symptom onset. And in embolectomy category, in patients who have clear contraindication to the thrombolysis, the emboli can be removed surgically or using a catheter. So the answer should be thrombolysis or embolectomy at this point of time. These are the, my priorities. Now, the next question would be, what are the absolute and relative contraindication to the thrombolysis? I am not going into detail. You have to read and uh, you have to remember at least four to five important absolute contraindications. Ischemic CBA within three months, known malignant intracranial neoplasm, known structural intracranial cerebrovascular disease, prior intracranial hemorrhage, suspected aortic dissection, active bleeding, recent spinal or neurosurgery, recent significant closed head or facial trauma. In the relative category, age greater than 75 years, anticoagulant therapy, pregnancy, recent internal bleeding, CPR more than 10 minutes, dementia, major surgery within three weeks, history of CVA within three months. Now, we would be now going into the CCS clinical vignette four. The decision is now made to administer alteplase. She has urgently received initial 10 milligram bolus over one to two minutes, followed by 90 milligram IV infusion over two hours. She was continued on high dose noradrenaline and adrenaline infusion. Patient was oliguric on the like, time of admission, which progressed to anuria. Repeat ABG revealed worsening metabolic acidosis with rising lactate. You have started with sodium bicarbonate infusion. 
again you decided for cbb hd because of this worsening uh, acidosis as well as rising lactate and on high vasopressor now continued uh, cardiogenic shock and lack of lactate clearance and the hemodynamic improvement and onset of mods prompted us to initiate peripheral VA ECMO. So this summarizes the clinical vignette code. So now I would be taking just a pause that from pulmonary embolism, now they have entered into another important aspect of cardiology and cardiac surgical critical care, that is VA ECMO. So now the questions would be, again, from the pulmonary embolism, now the focus would be, what are the indications of VA ECMO in general? So again, you have to divide, you have to have a structure, start with the cardiogenic shock in the background of ACS, stormy or malignant arrhythmia, myocarditis and pulmonary embolism. So our patient falls into this category. Cardiac trauma, post cardiotomy, that is inability to win from the cardiopulmonary bypass, post heart transplant graft failure, as a role, like it has a strong role in the bridging therapy, whether to transplant or whether to like bad ventricular assist device, drug overdose, anaphylaxis. So you have to remember at least two points from each category. What are the indications of VA ECMO in general? Now, what are the unique complications with VA ECMO? So that is the next question. And in this, we all know limb ischemia, but there is another important and peculiar complication with the peripheral VA ECMO that is LV distension. So, though we may find it little bit difficult, but the questions can go into detail of ECMO, which is right now used extensively in European ICUs as well as many other country uh, major centers. So, for that, you have to know in detail about ECMO because there were questions in the recently concluded EDIC part two and the questions were straight from ECMO. So that's why we have put this clinical scenario. Now, what do you mean by LV distension? So the LV distension, when you have done the peripheral VA ECMO, so there will be two possibilities. The forward flow would be also right now like not being done properly because of the poor contractility of LV. And also there is like a, or the anti-grade blood flow through the mitral valve. And I would explain what do you mean by LV distension in detail. Now, how do you detect it, the LV distension? So you have to do frequent echocardiography. Minimal opening of your aortic valve will find in the echocardiography. You have to do daily chest X-ray and in that you will find typical pulmonary edema picture, a large heart border. Increase wedge pressure and pulmonary artery pressure, and you have to also monitor the hemodynamics, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, then the 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 the, uh, the graphs. Then you have to also know the echocardiographic all the measurements. Now, for the LV distension, how do you manage that? If you are getting that, then the patient will not be like you no know, recovering from the ECMO uh, so easily. So for that, you have to decongest your heart. So for that, you have to know how, what are the management protocol for the LV distension. The first one would be reduce the afterload with vasodilatory agent if your MAP is permitting. Second one would be some anotropic agents to increase the LV contractility in a little bit of better way. You have to think seriously about the diuresis and ultrafiltration. And in this patient, CVVSD would be helpful for decongesting the, uh, the LV distension. IABP, you have to think about increasing the diastolic augmentation, catheter-based pump, and in uh, like refractory cases, you have to think about surgical maneuvers, and for that, you have to do first atrial septostomy to reduce the, like the, uh, the LV congestion, and also uh, you have to do the LV decompression directly by opening surgical LV venting. So these are the uh, things that would be helpful if you are getting LV distension. Now, two points I want to highlight here in the CCS clinical vignette 4. Thrombolysis is deemed unsuccessful if the clinical instability is persisting and after 36 hours also, your RB dysfunction remains unchanged. And there is another terminology the examiner may want to know and they may put in the uh, like questions. CT EPH, that is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. 
So the patient after recovery from this acute pulmonary embolism, maybe they would be presenting in later time, shortness of breath and reduced exercise tolerance within two years after the initial event. So the patient would be presented with peripheral edema or exertional chest pain. Those are some or other symptoms of RV dysfunction. So coming to the LV distension for the candidates who are still not very clear and they are not very familiar with the ECMO. So here two things are happening. I would be uh, taking the help of my presentation. Just a second. Is it visible? So, so LV distension, the VA ECMO, what has happened here, the ECMO, the all these apparatus, the catheter that would be uh, generating increased after load in the outer and the LV is like right now weak. So the impaired LV has to pump against this supraphysiologic after load. So that is the problem. Now, the LV may not be able to generate sufficient power to eject the blood and the aortic valve remaining closed throughout the cardiac cycle. So definitely that would create the stasis, the stagnancy of the blood in the LV. And for as a result, what would happen? There would be elevated pulmonary artery pressure, resulting in the pulmonary edema, and ultimately the LV recovery is getting hindered. So that is the explanation of LV distension and the, uh, the prognosis if you are getting LV distension without doing nothing, like right now, uh, anything. I have explained about the two things. Now, the question should be how to manage. I have already explained. Now, this is one article I want to share with you all in 2015. You have to read uh, like the indications and complications for VA ECMO in detail. You may get enough like literature and like all those images to like, get the idea what do you mean by LV distension. Now, this is VA ECMO. I don't want to go into detail, but contraindications for VA ECMO also you want to know. Unrecable cardiac function, patients who are not candidates for transplantation, chronic organ dysfunction, prolonged CPR without adequate tissue perfusion, and also with compliance limitations like financial, cognitive, psychiatric, and social limitations. So there is one thing what I want to uh, like uh, share with you. The PTT has to be 60 to 80 seconds to prevent the circuit thrombosis. Now, coming to the next clinical vignette, here it is written like uh, wrongly, but it is now the uh, fourth one. Patient vasopressor requirement started to downtrend after putting the patient on peripheral VA ECMO. Patient started improving 48 hours post commencing the VA ECMO. Now, there has happened some peculiar thing right now. Day 3 post commencement of ECMO, the SPO2 of right arm dropped to 88%. And you did the ABG from the right radial artery that confirmed the PAO2 of 45 millimeter. So this is another complication right now or peculiarity right now that has happened. But when you check the SPO2 from other extremities, they were normal. Chest X-ray demonstrated right upper lobe atelectasis. Echocardiogram showed improvement of LV systolic function with well opening of aortic valve. So what has happened? So the, the, the peculiar scenario here would automatically right now, if you have seen the this type of things or you have read it, then the question should follow. What is your diagnosis and what is the mechanism for such a complication? So this is Harlequin syndrome. Saturation of upper part of this body is lower than the lower half. Why this has happened or why this normally happens? This is due to some competition happening in the outer and that is the flow competition. So there is the LV is right now recovering and trying to like you know, push the blood forward. But the ECMO circuit is right now taking all the blood and get like you no know, pushing the oxygenated blood. So there is mixture of the deoxygenated blood and the oxygenated blood. I would show you the picture in the next slide. Now, if this is happening, this is a peculiar complication. How will you troubleshoot this condition? So you have to increase the PEEP or FIO2 to increase the uh, like the SPO2, optimize the ventilatory settings. If you still need ECMO support, maybe from the peripheral like uh, ECMO, VA ECMO, you have to think about or switching to the central cannulation, axillary or carotid. If 
heart has completely recovered you have done the echocardiography you are like pretty sure that yes we can think of decannulating it is the time to decannulate otherwise you will get this type of problems now conversion to the va v ecmo think of impella as the alternative support so these are some of the troubleshootings that could be coming to your mind now this harlequin syndrome is also known as north side south syndrome and this is a peculiar complication and you can see what i was trying to explain so this right now deoxygenated blood from the lb and the oxygenated blood from the ecls return right now mixing somewhere around the aortic arc and this would be this uh, like water side area and this is also named as differential hypoxia so this situation specifically occurs when the native lv function is improving on ecmo and competes with the upcoming stream of the uh, like from the femoral cannulation so this battle ground is drawn somewhere around the aortic arc and it is a fight between stroke volume from the native lv and the ecmo return so this is north south syndrome or harlequin syndrome in like a short if you want to see this is the right radial artery so you are getting the blood from here so that would be something which is uh, like this deoxygenated blood from the lv and oxygenated blood from the ecmo water side area and you are trying to get this blood and you will get the spo2 always or the po2 low in this region now there uh, is one question uh, what are the major trial pa ecmo as ecpr in the next one so uh, the answer to this is rs trial and cheer 2 trial so this would be the uh, the questions in the uh, the next uh, the question in the this clinical vignette now the cheer trial for all the students this was published in october 2014 and in short that has showed that ecmo for the refractory cardiac arrest shows promising survival rates if your protocolized care is applied in conjunction with predefined selection criteria just remember this is cheer 2 study and that has shown that you have to think about ecmo for refractory cardiac arrest the other one uh, this is this is the cheer trial and uh, this is the rs trial so these are the two trials that have shown that ecmo facilitated resuscitation for patients with out of hospital cardiac arrest or refractory ventricular fibrillation has significantly improved the survival to the hospital discharge compared with the standard acls treatment now moving further to the next clinical vignette you have stopped sedation the patient was not waking up appropriately and now had upper motor neuron sign you did the ct brain immediately because you have stopped the sedation and you found in the ct scan this type of image so there is one significant ics that has happened in the ecmo patient so now at this point of time from pulmonary embolism the examiner has uh, tracked you to the uh, the ecmo now from ecmo there has happened some complication and in this complication what are the risk factors for uh, like ics you have to know about rapid hypocapnia female gender high precannulation sopa score septic shock pre ecmo morbidity thrombocytopenia around less than 20 30 uh, all the thousand for ml use of heparin hemolysis so this could be the risk factor for ics in ecmo what are the mechanism of ics in ecmo patient low cerebral blood flow hypoxia acidosis reperfusion injury rapid shift in the pco2 and po2 lead to the vasoconstriction that has happened and leading to the ics prothrombin trick conditions like the patient has landed up in sepsis and that is also the one of the mechanism for the ics in ecmo and pre existing anticoagulation antiplatelets that has resulted in ics so the questions from like uh, the ics would end up with risk factors and mechanism now next clinical vignette on day 5 the patient was decannulated successful he due to the recovery of the lv and the heart now you held the sedation for almost 48 hours the gcs right now is e1 bt m2 his kidney functions improve and his urea creatinine and liver function test are within normal limit he is making 30 to 50 ml of urine per hour his last fentanyl dose was 48 hours ago and has been off propofol since the bedside nurse right now at this point of time on examination found tonic roving movement of the eyes 
the electrolytes are 148, 4.8, magnesium, calcium, phosphate levels are within normal limit. Now, you did the ABG, that is within the normal limit. He has no neck stiffness and has been febrile for last 48 hours. So, this would be the next clinical vignette. Now, the questions would follow, what is your differential diagnosis at this point of time? And what is your provisional diagnosis for his encephalopathy? So, the differential diagnosis would be non-convulsive seizure, progression of the IC bleed, any other intracranial event such as new ischemic stroke or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, how will you further evaluate this patient? You have to do one EEG to rule out non-convulsive seizure or something else what is happening in the brain. And also you have to rule out any potential drug that you are continuing with that is causing encephalopathy. So that would be the two questions in the next clinical vignette. And how will you treat this patient? So for the seizure part, non-convulsive seizure part, midazolam or lorazepam, you have to incrementally dose to like increase the dose to stop any clinical signs. Load with levitrisatum. If still has ongoing seizure in the EEG, you have to add the other one that is phenytoin. Can consider lorazepam or valproate. You have to monitor continuously with continuous EEG. So that would be the treatment or management part at this point of time. Now, the next question, how does non-convulsive seizure affect, that means the morbidity, that is the length of stay and mortality to the convulsive status epilepticus. So here, one important thing, we all know non-convulsive seizure is more dangerous. That means longer length of stay and worse mortality compared to convulsive seizure because sometimes it gets so delayed in the diagnosis and the, in the management part. So this ends the CCS1, so the patient started with acute pulmonary embolism, landed up in the ECMO management. In the ECMO, there happened some complications like in the neurologic, neurosurgical domain and in the neurosurgical domain, it again ended up with some or other monitoring and complications that is non-convulsive seizure and finally, the question ended with the few evidence-based structure questions about the non-convulsive seizure. So with this, we end the CCS. And uh, I know it is a little bit of like uh, terrifying from the first one. The questions were a little bit difficult, but uh, this was intentional to know or to let you know that the questions can come from different domains. If there are any questions. There are no questions in the chat box, Tapas. I think you have... Um, elaborately explain the question and the possible questions. So um, from my perspective, I think it was very well done. Uh, I think we have our mentors, both Dr. Shushrut and Dr. Ramanathan are on. Uh, I can ask them if they have any input before you proceed. We proceed to the next section. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Ramanathan, welcome. Yeah, thanks. That was, um, yeah, that was a very intriguing case. I would uh, not be, I wouldn't want to be in the EDIC exam for a case like this. Um, clearly quite um, uh, advanced level of management. And uh, again, you know, see, the, the bottom line here is you cannot avoid or predict uh, how difficult some of the questions can be. But essentially, you know, um, apart from the section on, say, some of the unique complications of VA, um, I would think most of the other things pertains to general critical care um, management of a PE patient. And essentially, you know, things like how do you look out for, say, an intracranial bleed, management of intracranial bleed. Uh, all it shows is essentially, you know, um, the edict questions are structured in such a way that you you need to, there, there is essentially a big stem and, and you are essentially supposedly 
following that stem very neatly with a list of differentials and the examiner will essentially you know tip you or pinpoint you and you can use the clues given in your vignettes to to further substantiate the direction in which you're going ahead and and 90 percent of the time you know you would go along the right flow to reach or or to satisfy the examiner uh, if you take a wrong track essentially the duty of the examiner is to get you or guide you into the stem again and make sure that you know you come up with more differentials or more um, suggestions few things to be careful about i mean this is in general uh, answering an ed question is not about having verbal diarrhea i mean essentially you know you just need to be very succinct pinpoint keep your answer short but make sure that you know uh, you cover some of the major points of the questions asked there may be things which you would still miss and the examiner might uh, prompt you if you have missed it. Clearly, you know, that will give you more brownie points. Uh, but if you have already said what was expected of you, the examiner would just move on. And I think, you know, that's going to be important. And that's where, you know, when you start moving from in this patient who had PE, to say general critical care management of the PE patient in the ICU, um, management of his uh, uh, C mechanical ventilation, the thrombolysis, and, and all those bits. I think, you know, these are things which you should otherwise know. So clearly, you know, this is expected of you. And if, if you are unable to answer such questions, these are pretty straightforward questions which you can score heavily. While something like management of LV distension on VA ECMO, not all candidates might answer. So you can, you can, very well expect that such difficult questions, um, uh, if it's going to be difficult for you, it's going to be difficult for many of the others too. And, and uh, you may want to move on to the next set of questions where you might want to score, start scoring again. And at that point, you know, uh, uh, whatever little you know about EB distension, you say that and you can tell the examiner, I'll come back to this question later, let's move on to the next set of questions. So then, you know, you would then be surprised to find that there is a patient with intracranial bleed and how you manage intracranial bleed and you have read anything and everything about management, IC management of uh, patients with intracranial bleed. So, you know, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is, yeah, don't, don't get flustered by the complexity of the question. Um, everything eventually boils down to basics. If you stick to basics, you still will be able to hover around and move on to the next domain which you might be able to answer and that's how you face challenging difficult situations in an exam so uh, managing these uh, small uh, instances of uh, what i think is uh, extraordinary questions um it's sometimes you know it's it's <laughs> Still worthwhile saying, I don't know. I don't know is a perfectly acceptable answer and, and move on to the next um, rather than brooding over it. Um, and, and I think, you know, when you do that in such exams, you will find that you will come across more questions that you know. And, and uh, you may be able to answer the entire set of questions that is uh, required of you. Um, but otherwise, you know, I have nothing more to add to what Tapas has already elaborated. He's taken a master class on VA ECMO, and uh, that was that was quite nice. Um, at least you should be familiar with the concept, the indication, contraindication, the common complications. And mind you, you know, even though the examiners bring in such uh, novel concepts, um, the they still would stick to some of the basics because they understand that not everyone of you would 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 have managed such patients. So don't 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 panic when you come across um, some difficult bits and pieces during your exam uh, vignet. Thanks, Tapas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So this, uh, I know this question set up like what we have made is like uh, Dusra by Muraldar. But yes, uh, we tried to uh, give you a like wholesome, like a pragmatic approach that you, in case you get this type of question scenario, just stick to the basics. What uh, Dr. Ramanathan has clearly mentioned 
and in like after one or two question you will get again the like no fresh questions which would be uh, easily like answerable doctor uh, uh, like uh, if time permits we would be requesting doctor susruta if he are joined he has some clinical work urgent one patient deteriorated but if he is here uh, sir please you can answer any time or you can explain any time. so doctor sanand if we do not have any more question you can start with your ccs yes the first i think dr sushrut is not there in the, in yeah, the... he had messaged me that he has some yeah. like yeah. urgent yeah, he was earlier there yeah. all right so um the curriculum of uh, cardiothoracic and cardiology domain i think tapas is going to talk about it later on just just what you need to read what you don't need to read uh, but specifically my section of the ccs and cbs is touching on these things so bit of a ibp bit of a pacing that is very very important for the exam um before going into detail my name is sananta as i told earlier i work as a intensivist in north queensland uh, the place where there are a lot of crocodiles uh, but that's a very good place to work um so our course is in module 1 now so we have 10 more modules to go along with three mock test that will happen each week ending in the end of uh, september uh, giving enough room or time to go through revise again uh, through the whole course so you guys can have a month or so before your final exam so that's the first vignette we have uh, in the ccs so 71 year male admitted to icu post mitral valve replacement with left atrial appendage ligation he has a background of rheumatic heart disease atrial fibrillation and was on warfarin which was stopped 5 days ago he was maintained on heparin infusion in the hospital before the surgery the left ventricular ejection fraction was low normal with a moderate rv dysfunction his pulmonary artery systolic pressure is 65 mm mercury and on admission of to the icu the following are the vitals so that's the chest x ray you can see the mitral valve sitting there there is a um, endotracheal tube uh, sternal wires couple of drains there and some few ecg leads going here and there there is no pneumothorax bit of effusion on the left side his heart rate is 60 he is paced vvi his blood pressure is 80 um, over 46 mm of mercury there is a low cvp 2 mm of mercury he is on a prvc mode of ventilation with uh, 0.5 fio2 tidal volume of 500 ml and his plateau pressures are acceptable at 24 cm of water he has uh, two chest strains one in the left pleura and the other one is a mediastinal drain the drain output since arrival So to the icu the last one hour is 250 ml he is currently on 3 microgram per minute of noradrenaline infusion admission blood gas and chest x ray are as following so that's the chest x ray and that's the blood gas on the blood gas um pretty much looks normalish but with a low uh, calcium level po2 is 120 sorry 117 with a pa with a fio to a 0.5 his lactate is near normal glucose is fine electrolytes are okay apart from a low potassium of 3.7 so basically low calcium low potassium with a normal looking blood gas otherwise so the first question is what are the possible causes of shock in this patient um so very very common in the exam if you get a septic patient if you get a bleeding patient if you get a cardiothoracic patient if you get a cardiac patient you will get a question on what is the possible causes of shock this is the first question or opening um, over of the match so they always start with what is the differential of the shock so they ask you about a differential of the shock always mention about type of shock and what is the most probable one to start with okay in this case for my uh, thought process cardiogenic shock probably because of the stunt myocardium post surgery he has a low paced heart rate also that can be contributing to the shock there may be chances of pneumothorax or tamponade constituting the obstetric shock he may be bleeding due to coagulopathy or surgical bleeding so hemorrhagic shock 
may be vasoplegic because of the post pump scenario but or the patient may be rewarming or he is on a hefty dose of sedative and the fifth one is a hypovolemic which is again due to the uh, low fluid status or bleeding in trough not being replaced so always go for a systemic answer about shock and put the highest possible uh, diagnosis or probable diagnosis in the front and then uh, go down the ladder if you say oh it is a bleeding case but you will get only one ma mark for that and you will lose three marks so you have to have a structured answer make the structure before the exam rather than on the side because on the side you will not be able to so that's why the practice of answering is important second question was how will you distinguish each type of shock so it can divert to anything they can go into bleeding how do and the bleeding patient uh, in a cardiac surgery they can ask you about the type of shock they can ask you a few other things around it so it it opens the whole box of worm and and you can be asked any question in this case we decided to ask you about the shock so how will you distinguish between the shock cardiogenic shock first thing you do is a TTE or a TOE depending on your facility and availability. Obstructive shock, you do either a lung ultrasound to rule out a pneumothorax or a chest x-ray. Tamponade again, TTE and TOE, chest x-ray, narrow pulse pressure, rising lactate, all these things are signs of, of, um, of a tamponade. Hemorrhagic shock, the patient may be overtly bleeding or there may be occult bleeding in other sites such as in the chest or in the abdomen. Or hypovolemia, how do you rule out? Is by echo and looking at CVP, which is only 2 millimeter of mercury, though it is not reliable, but a trend may be helpful. So again, there is a structure to the answer that is most important in the exam. Now, how do you manage this case? So think of what you do practically. For a patient who is post-cardiac surgery immediately with a low blood pressure, who has a pacing rate of 60, has come to you, how will you manage? The first thing I will do is to increase the heart rate because cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So you have to increase the heart rate to 80 or 90 and see the effect if it is getting better. Now to assess what is the cause, you do an echo to see the fluid, uh, fluid status, to look for any new LV dysfunction, which can be a stunt myocardium post-surgery or rule out a tamponade, most important thing. If the patient is running on 50 of propofol, reduce it to a suitable dose, right? So reduce the sedative if it is there. If the patient is bleeding, now go for the bleeding pathway. How do you do? So if you have a rotum in your practice, do a rotum to see what is correctable, what is not correctable. And rule out other possible causes of shock, such as if there is a baseline adrenal insufficiency, if someone is already on, uh, on the... Um, uh, steroid replacement due to any other disease and that you haven't done or if the patient had a inhibitor just prior to the surgery things like that so start from the most important thing the most immediate thing that you are going to do and go to a process that i'll increase the heart rate give some fluid bolus take the echo machine to have a look at the heart to rule out any tamponade any ongoing bleeding and how is the fluid status of the patient I will do a rotum if the drain output is high or more than expected to see if there is a, um, a coagulation deficiency, a coagulation disorder. Again, if you the important thing I want to mark is how heavily these, these questions are scored, like five marks, three marks, four marks. If you just stop like, oh, okay, he's bleeding, I'll give some fluid and see the response, you'll get only one mark. You lose all those marks. So you have to have a process of answering these questions. What you do day to day in ICU, try to put those knowledge into that. Okay. Now the vignette two again, there is ongoing increased output from the drain, and he is also woozy at the drain insertion site. His rotum rotum demonstrated the following. So I think um, I would say probably in European practice is not very dissimilar to where I practice in in, in Australia. So the, we usually predominantly look at the rotum rather than the tech. And I believe uh, that would be if they are going to show you a uh, point of uh, care coagulation study, but they may show you a take, take um, a graph rather than a rotem. But my my bet it will be on rotem. If you are getting a getting a point of care coagulation test, it will be a rotem. In this case, abnormality wise, as you can see, they are already marked with pink or red. 
So most important thing is to see the A5 in 15. So 15 A5 is four millimeter, which is less than the normal. So it, it refers to a fibrinogen deficiency. So what is the abnormality you can see in the rotum? So rotum shows a fibrinogen deficiency with a 15 at five minute of four, which is low than the, lower than the normal. And how will you manage? So if you see the, there is a fibrinogen deficiency, A5 is only four, you manage it with fibrinogen replacement, either you give cryoprecipitate or you give uh, fibrinogen concentrate. And then after giving, repeat the rotum 15 to 30 minutes to see whether you have corrected it or not, right? That's the basic way how you approach this. We need three for this patient, post rotum based correction. The bleeding slowed down. The environment went from whatever was three microgram per minute to 20 microgram per, per minute. And he was started on vasopressin to maintain his systolic blood pressure of 90 and a MAP of 60 to 65. His CVP has now rose to 13 from two, which was earlier with only 200 ml of crystalloid loading. Repeat blood gas show worsening metabolic acidosis with a pH of 7.14 and a lactate of 4.8 and a bicarb of 12. His last hour urine output has tailed off to 15 ml, ml per hour and his current vitals are as following. So heart rate, you have increased already to a VVI pacing. It's 80. There's a narrow pulse pressure of only 18. The saturation is 100 on FIO to 0.4. The noradrenaline requirement has increased from 3 microgram to 20 microgram per minute and you have started the patient on vasopressin. So basically someone who is worsening shock, who has worsening shock with a hyperlactatemia at this moment, um, and uh, his uh, acidosis has worsened. So it's probably a worsening shock in this case, and looks like with minimal fluid loading, his, his uh, CVP has gone up, his pulse pressure has um, narrowed down, and that is very acute change. It's 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 a self-explanatory differential here. Probably it's a tamponade, right? So usually the cardiothoracic cases they end up with either a cardiogenic shock due to LV dysfunction or a stunt myocardium, or it 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 usually tails off to a complication of the surgery such as a bleeding or a pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax. So these are the um, expected question where the, um, where the question stream will migrate gradually, right? So in this case, the patient has a tamponade based on the history that you get. So what is your next plan of action? So this is a possible tamponade. Now, how do you manage a tamponade in the ICU? Bedside echo or a short focused echo as soon as possible to look for tamponade physiology and uh, look for the other, other differentials such as fluid status and contractility. If there is a tamponade, then you need urgent surgical referral or activation of the code and preparedness to open the chest in the ICU or if the patient has uh, acceptable blood pressure but it is a downtrending one and you have time to wheel him to the theater then open the chest in the theater depending on where you practice what is the usual scenario there uh, you aim to be prepared to open the chest as soon as possible if there is a tamponade right now, the next question was describe the tamponade physiology and how do you explain the raised lactate in this case? So the tamponade can be questioned in many ways. So they can ask you about the physiology. They can ask you uh, about how do you manage. They can ask you the procedure of how do you open the chest because it is getting more and more um, uh, acceptable that in an acute situation when the patient is peri arrest or arrested with a tamponade, as an intensivist, you should know how to open the chest just to relieve the pressure there, right? So it is an acceptable or expected uh, skill that the, that the uh, intensivists more and more are acquiring and they're expected to have. So they expect also a little bit of knowledge around peri uh, cardiac uh, surgery, cardiac arrest, and how do you manage all those things, right? So in this case, uh, describe the tamponade physiology. So there is collection of blood in the pericardium, which is relatively a fixed structure. And there is restriction of atrial and ventricular filling. There is equalization of pressure in all chambers and there is decreased forward flow from the heart. So basically two or three buzzword there that you have to tell, talk about. So pericardium is more of a restrictive structure. It, it cannot expand beyond a certain limit. And there is restriction to both atrial and ventricular filling. So restriction of filling, then equalization of pressure. This is the most important thing you have to tell. That's what drives the physiology of tamponade and there is decreased cardiac output after that. 
cause of lactate. So raised lactate can be due to low perfusion state. The patient has been hypotensive for some time or it can be due to the congestive hepatopathy because of the back pressure because nothing is going forward in the forward direction, right? It, there are other causes of uh, uh, hyperlactatemia, high dose of, high dose of uh, adrenaline or catecholamine can cause also. All right. So now going to unit four, the patient had a PEA cardiac arrest in the next five minutes, which is all expected with a tamponade. And the question asks you, what is your management priorities or what are your priorities? Now you have to be very practical in your answering. What you do, just tell it, right? Don't have to be very descriptive about the process because it will kill time. So you need to be very precise what you do, specific answer. Um, there will be very less time for these type of questions. They will be asking some important points in that. So in this case, enumerate your priorities. So ensure that the patient has 100% oxygen. Disconnect the pacing to ensure that there is no fine VF underlying. If it is a PARS and just the pacemaker is kicking off, then it can mask the um, mask the fine VF. So in that case, sometimes you have to disconnect it. If there is a VF, then shock. Or if there is a shockable rhythm underlying, then shock the patient and start the CPR. Be prepared for immediate chest opening. Just call an immediate chest opening call. Inform the surgical and anesthetic team. Arrange for blood and blood products. And rule out other reversible causes, which includes the 5H and 5Ts of the cardiac arrest algorithm. So very specific answer. Importantly, airway breathing pattern. So airway breathing circulation. In airway, the airway is already secured. The patient is on the ventilator. You may switch over to a bag mask in that, sorry, bag and a tube method of ventilating because uh, with the CPR ongoing, it is difficult for the ventilator to ventilate the patient also. It is recommended to go to a uh, bag um, ventilation for the patient. Uh, you have to disconnect the pacing. If you think there is a fine VF going on, then it will be amenable to shock and then immediate chest opening and preparedness for that. At the same time, ruling out other differential for the shock, right? Now the question number nine, how quickly chest opening should be achieved? Uh, this is a theoretical question. So less than five minutes is the accepted or is the, is the expected time frame where the chest should be open in case of a cardiac arrest in pericardiotomy patient. And if it is achieved, um, if the patient is not achieved to have a systolic blood pressure of less than or more than 60, then it has to be done within five minutes of that cardiac arrest. Okay. Now, we need five. The, the rhythm of the patient degenerates to VF. How do you manage this? So, how will you manage? So, here we'll, we are talking about the, um, the cardiac arrest. Uh, algorithm for a patient who has a cardiac surgery. So post-cardiac surgery, cardiac arrest, the algorithm is slightly different than what we do usual ACLS or ALS protocol. It is different from that. So this uh, vignette aims to look at your understanding about the uh, ACLS protocol or about the cardiac arrest protocol for a patient who had a cardiac surgery recently which is slightly different from the usual one. So I will recommend for you guys to read that paper, which is already given in your, in your study material earlier. Very, very important in terms of exam. You need to read that paper and know things in and out of that paper. Because if you are going to get a cardiothoracic patient as a case in the exam, this will be there. Very, very high percentage, right? Now, how will you manage? So in this case, the patient has VF and we do three stack shocks. In, in this algorithm, not, not like one shock, usual, usual ACLS protocol, you do three stack shock one after the other. What is the recommended adrenaline dose? So we usually give 50 to 100 microgram in incremental doses, not like one milligram at, uh, at a single go, like the usual cardiac arrest protocol, because with the hypertensive response, there is a very high risk of worsening the situation like a graft rupture or a or a, or a valve rupture or something, the suture rupture. So in that case, we give small helicots of adrenaline, 50 to 100 mics intermittently, depending on the response. How will you manage the ventilation? I talked about earlier, 100% oxygen change to a bag, bag ventilation because it is more controlled compared to a ventilator, which will be interfering with the uh, CPR or chest compression and if possible we can decrease the PEEP because that will be a determinant for the preload to the heart so switch off the PEEPs it is recommended that you can decrease the PEEP right 
Now, how will you manage if the patient has an IABP in situ? This patient doesn't have, but they can they can have a patient on IABP who has arrested post cardiac surgery. So, how will you manage? In that case, to trigger to enable the trigger of the of the IABP, you can change it over to a pressure trigger and continue the CPR as usual for a post cardiac patient, right? So they will be uh, eager to listen about the pressure trigger. So change to pressure trigger. This is true for the old machine where um, uh, you don't have auto trigger. But for the newer machine, I think if if the patient is in is in cardiac arrest, then probably it, it goes automatically if you are doing a CPR to a pressure trigger. So I haven't done ever to change a uh, IABP machine to a pressure trigger, but that's recommended in the guideline. Um, we need six. The patient has the chest opened in the ICU and the return of spontaneous circulation is achieved. He returned to the theater for re-exploration and bleeder was found and secured. He is now back in ICU. His current vasopressor and inotrope requirements are as following. So vasopressin is still at a dose of 0 .4, 0 0.04 unit per minute. Nor adrenaline is 25. So it has gone up again, 20 to 25. He is now on adrenaline at 10 mics. And his blood lactate level is measured and was reported to be 12 millimoles per liter, which is pretty high. What are the differentials of the lactatemia in this case now? now? Again, the same thing, shock and hypoperfusion. It can be due to a combination of all these things. So adrenaline effect plus the shock and hypoperfusion. It can be due to the congestive hepatopathy or ischemic hepatopathy that has happened during the shock and cardiac arrest. So these are differential for lactatemia. What is the physiology of hyperlactatemia due to adrenaline? So as you said, if you have answered about adrenaline, then the next question is will follow. Why adrenaline causes hyperlactatemia? Just a basic understanding of the physiology. They may ask for these questions as a special marking question. So in this case, adrenaline causes an increase in sodium potassium ATPase activity leading to increased lactate in the, in the uh, glycolysis. And those lactate are not used up completely in the in the Krebs cycle, leading to a shunt of the lactate, causing hyperlactatemia. Or you can say there is uncoupling of glycolysis to the TCA cycle because of excessive glycolysis that can happen with adrenaline. So that's the physiological basis why adrenaline causes hyperlactatemia. Now, we need seven on day two of the ICU. Stay. The patient was turned uh, was was turned for routine pressure care, and he became hypotensive with the immediate 12 lead ECG showing the following. So, what is there in the ECG? That will be the question. As you can see, there are pacing spikes, but not followed by a QRS complex. So, the patient has lost capture, and the underlying rhythm is a complete heart block with a very low heart rate. Right. So, that's the underlying rhythm. Now. What abnormality can you detect? So loss of ventricular capture, that's the most important thing. The patient is bradycardic, that's an additional finding, a probable complete heart block also. How will you manage this acute crisis? So in this case, tell what you do usually in that case, okay? Don't have to be, um, as, as Dr. Ramanathan was saying, you don't have to have a verbal diarrhea there. Answer the question what you do usually in the ICU in such a situation. So in this case, the patient has already a pacemaker in situ. Uh, epicardial pacing wires are there connected to a pacing box. So increase the pacemaker ventricular output, whatever it is, to the maximum possible because it is a capture issue. If unable to capture with a non-perfusing rhythm or BP, then start the patient CPR or start CPR. External pacing with maximum output and arrange for an immediate transvenous pacing if possible. If you can uh, start or, or if he's amenable to external, then that is the next thing to do with the pads outside. Now, if nothing works, the patient has lost output or has a decreased cardiac output and uh, it, it is not responding to your usual immediate management, then consider again chest reopening. If the, if the patient is going into a peri situation, again, rule out other causes of possible um, refractory um, bradycardia, such as other electrolyte abnormalities that can cause it. So basically answer the way you do in the ICU. So first you increase the output of the pacemaker, then I see whether there is a capturing rhythm or not. If not, then apply the uh, external pacemaker if it is not working. Then you don't have much options in that case. Start 
uh, to arrange for a transvenous spacing. If the patient is going into arrest, then probably reopening of the chest and rule out other differentials for that. Now that finishes the uh, CCS part. Um, any input from the faculties or anyone? I would be happy to answer or if they can add something into there. Very well explained, Dr. Sanal. I would request uh, Dr. Ramanathan and Dr. Susruta. Dr. Susruta has joined. Welcome, sir. Dr. Ramanathan, would you please add anything to the discussion? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, again, you know, another comprehensive case whereby your... Uh, I mean, of course, this is one domain, again, which is quite popular in any exam, including the edict. And as um, Dr. Dash rightly put it, uh, it, can, it, can, it can take any, um, it, can, it can take any direction because the stem is big. So you can, you can expect it to go in any direction. Um, so you need to be prepared for some of the commoner questions coming out of this domain. One is bleeding in a post-operative cardiac surgical patient to cardiac arrest in a post-op cardiac surgical patient. Um, three, worsening shock state in a cardiac surgical patient. Need for IABP and essentially uh, the whole uh, um, set of questions on IABP, the waveforms and the way it augments um, and the, and the evidence for IABP in this context. So all these things are possible questions. Again, pacemaker is the other gadget that is commonly used in a cardiothoracic ICU. So you know the 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 other other uh, gadgets would be mainly hemodynamic monitors. I see that you have a separate session on hemodynamic monitor altogether. So again, you know that that can be um, attached to this particular set of uh, vignettes. And, and uh, you may find that you may start a thoracic surgical patient in the post-operative ward, but the discussion eventually leads to PA catheter management of uh, this patient based on PA catheter measurement of cardiac output and other things. So, or the last things, I mean, the few other things which it can lead to would be arrhythmias other than VF. So you can have a patient with an unstable AF, management of atrial fibrillation, and, and, you know, long-term management of these patients once they leave ICU or once they are about to be discharged from ICU. So, again, you know, the, the domain itself or the specialty itself is so vast that they can start off with one small spark and, and eventually go to another extreme uh, where which you might not even expect. So, these are things which, um, again, one... You cannot be learning just before the exam. So you need to have seen some patients with cardiac surgery, sorry, some cardiac surgical patients at least, or at least have managed them uh, to understand the basic set of questions that come by. And I think um, Sanatan has touched upon most of the questions that are popular in this domain. Uh, things like hyperlactatemia and such patients in the post-operative period it's a common problem we all face and, and um, the way I look at it or the way I essentially uh, dissect when patients have hyperlactatemia and my registrar calls me um, is, is I keep it simple. So the lactate can come from the heart. So the patient has either a periop or MI. The other source of lactate is your liver. So ischemic hepatitis is one such possibility. Uh, the third source is your abdomen. So post-CPB, they are at risk of ischemic gut. So again, lactate can um, arise from the gut. Then, you know, in patients with IABP, limb is a source of lactate. So essentially, you know, limb ischemia can manifest with hyperlactatemia. In addition to the routine causes of hyperlactatemia, whether it's type A, type B, and all this stuff. So in a post-cardiac surgical patient, these would be the four major differentials that, that I would project um, in addition to the other causes. Again, the trick here is come out with a list and, and see if, if the examiner can pull out uh, the one in his grid. Um, 
and and hopefully you'd have mentioned it in the first attempt. If not, the examiner would still prompt you any other cause or what do you think of um, the drugs used in this scenario, which could cause hyperlactatemia. And then, you know, you'd then come out by saying, you know, adrenaline, norad, and all these things can cause hyperlactatemia. So again, you know, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's about playing the cards properly. Uh, and, and I think, you know, most of the other things have been discussed. So um, nothing much to add to uh, particular domain. But rest assured that cardiology and cardiothoracic domain, um, you cannot ignore it in an exam. Clearly, you know, they are interrelated. Questions from one set would overflow to the other and vice versa. So be prepared with this set of questions when you prepare for your EDIC exam. Yes, yes, rightly said, sir. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Is long in part an appropriate answer for chest X-ray question? So, which context it depends on? I think Dr. Ramanathan is muted. Yeah, sorry about that. And um, what, what, what was the question, Tapas? Yeah, there is a question. Is lung infarct an appropriate answer for the chest X-ray question? Dr. Sanan, could you please go to the chest X-ray question? Um, actually, there was no chest X-ray question. Yeah, no that's what uh, I was also confused. So did he mean this that? Was just a chest X-ray, not a chest X-ray question. Just to show um, this is the chest X-ray. But there's nothing, there's no lung, lung infarct in that. So in, in any sense, I mean, lung infarct is, to me, it's not possible to diagnose on a chest X-ray saying it is a lung infarct. So it'll present, it'll present as, a, as some sort of infiltrate or some sort of opacity in the lung, which has a very, very wide differential. So I don't think lung infarct is an is a answer to whatever question you are talking about. So I would say it is a... Uh, I don't think it is a, it is an option to, as a differential. Yes, you can. Yeah, like lung in fact due to pulmonary embolism can cause a necrotic abscess there. So that that can be a sort of thing. But I don't think there is a differential for any question as a lung in fact. If 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 that is pertinent the question, I, I can't understand the question either. So there's another one. It says in rotum question there was aptem and heptem. There was yes. So it is a panel of four. So usually in my practice, we get a four panel. So intem, aptem, heptem, and uh, fiptem. Um, sometimes the uh, heptem is not there if it is not a cardiothoracic surgery patient. So depending on what you are looking at, which patient you either do heptem or not. So if they are around bypass, we usually run the heptem. If they are bleeding on the bypass, then this is how we do it. Uh, but you may, may get a get a GI bleed patient with a rotum there. So he doesn't need a heptem there. So it, it will not be there. So it depends on what type of patient it is. Yeah, okay. One thing that, that you need to consider in a post-op bleeding patient is, is the patient's post-CPB. So yeah. hypothermia is, is one of the important things. So that's, that's usually presented in the vignette and uh, you may skip it. When you read through it, you may find that they might have written that the temperature is 35.2. And in the in the in the rush uh, of reading the question, that might not hit you hard. And you will soon find that the stem eventually expands into postoperative bleeding, and the examiner asks you what are the possible causes of postoperative bleeding in this patient. And hypothermia might be one of the answers that will be expected in the grid. I just just I mean, some, some, some loose points here and there, but I know, you know, most of you would be prepared for such questions anyways. In Rotem, I, I have one question. In Rotem, there were, there were four images. So I was confused which one to see and answer. So the basic fundamental is you correct the fifth time. You start with the fifth time. So if you don't correct the fifth time, rest of the rest of the numbers don't matter. So you have to correct the fibrinogen first, looking at the rotum, right? So that's why the question was plotted uh, to show you the four tem there. 
and what you are going to work on so first you correct the correct the fibrinogen deficiency and see how the coagulation changes after that so the first point we see is the fibtem because this is the earliest thing that you look for the fibtem comes within 5 minutes or 10 minutes depending on which center you are practicing so we do at 5 minutes and 10 minutes so fibtem 5 and fibtem 10 Uh, so that is the earliest parameter that comes up on the machine, and that's the earliest thing you can correct. So first thing you have to correct is the fibtem. That's why after fibtem correction with the cryo or fibrinogen, you repeat another rotum to see what is the response to that, and then probably the coagulation profile or coagulation, um, what do you call coagulation uh, display on the screen will be better compared to earlier, and then that will give you a better. better representation of what is happening in that case if the aptem is abnormal or if the heptem is abnormal then you can think of yes this is going to happen we have corrected the fibrinogen part of it rest let's see the second part or third part of the coagulation the first thing you have to see is the fibrinogen level that's why the answer was to correct the fibtem with the fibrinogen and cryo okay but this one you will explain later in some other class like all we'll in the we would try to because that will take another 2 hours to explain the whole uh, whole process of that so we'll try to put a demo class um sometime um, as as a as a uh, as a class to all of you on rotem okay okay yeah. sure thank you all right so thank you thank you dr sanand dr ramnathan so uh, just one uh, quick uh, uh, information like these are the topics you have to write during the debrief that you need after like we finishes the debrief because otherwise what will happen each topic domain what we are discussing like iabp like pulmonary embolism like ecg like echo like uh, ecmo it will all take like you know 3 hours or 4 hours discussion so we urge you all to go through all these topics pick up like important articles related to that one or two review article or some like uh, basic article and clear your concept in the meantime otherwise it won't be possible for anybody to like you not know, take four or five lectures and you will be also bored you have to clear your concept first then come up with the questions so that we can discuss in that group okay so without uh, wasting further time dr sanan would you please stop sharing so that i can share the screen we have to be little bit in like uh, hurry so that we we finish it because there are 25 cps questions uh, we have to finish then like 10 or 15 slides about some of the important uh, domains yeah okay perfect okay so this okay so we are starting with the cps question number 1 so this was the question uh, Shared with you all. So the first question: What is the answer? Can anybody tell to me, like uh, right now, because we have to be little bit interactive. Yeah. Late. Why you are telling the late? Yeah. Late IABP. Late IABP inflation. What will the what will be the effect of late inflation? yeah poor coronary flow like diastolic blood pressure will not increase as expected that will causes the poor compromised coronary blood flow and there will be some uh, back back uh, like backward supply to the other organs in the coronary okay. and uh, okay so uh, excellent so this opens up a like you no know, panel of questions so we have to know early inflation late inflation early deflation late deflation the high uh, filling pressure the high the plateau pressure of iabp so there are lot of trouble shooting the questions can come from any domain iabp is a very high yielding domain i don't want to discuss because it will again take two hours just for the sake of like completion we have to discuss about the indication the contraindications the like the complications then the normal iabp waveform what are the trouble shooting then uh, like the many things which would be asked so you have to read so write in your like paper iabp will be one of the favorite domain in part 1 as well as part 2 of edk exam so uh, as you rightly told delayed or late inflation of iabp uh, balloon sub optimal augmentation of diastolic blood pressure and inadequate coronary perfusion just for the sake of for like uh, one uh, quick clue so with late inflation the balloon inflates after the aortic valve closes so you would get the diacrotic notch is actually preceding 
the inflation point and touch and the inflation point created w sec so just remember for the sake of in like if you don't have time just see if you are getting a w then it would be late inflation if it is u you would get something so you have to remember in certain ways so that in case of like you are having no time you have to immediately pick up okay so this is you have to know what is a what is b what is d what is e and f just for the sake of understanding i have kept this picture not very much important now so this is early uh, the late one we have already discussed the early one i just showed this is a u big u it's a clue and uh, yeah, it occurred prior to the outing valve closure indicated by the absence of the diacritic notch and as a result what would happen so uh, maybe uh, there would be possible outing regurgitation and uh, there would be also impairment of the left ventricular emptying because of this early intraoutic uh, balloon pump inflation so as a result what would happen all the pressures would increase like left ventricular end diastolic volume end diastolic pressure pulmonary capillary waste pressure and as a result what would happen so there would be increase in the after load and after load by that i am uh, like uh, hinting towards the left ventricular wall stress and as a result what would happen when there will be increase in the after load there would be increased myocardial oxygen consumption so these are the two important things what i want to share that is early and the late so moving forward so there would be uh, what are the indications of iibp then contraindications of iibp so there are a lot of questions i don't want to go into detail or uh, rather i would be going into the next question the question number 2 for the cps you got a call to see a patient on the ward who has a return of spontaneous circulation following a cardiac arrest the patient is groaning now on initial assessment you find patent airway bilateral equal chest movement just one second respiratory rate 18 breaths per minute spo2 94% on high flow oxygen heart rate is 45 beats per minute which is regular poor pulse volume blood pressure 57 by 30 mm mercury patient is conscious but not fully alert and blood glucose is 5.5 ecg done which showed So what is the ECG rhythm here, and what is the diagnosis, and what are the immediate treatment? Any answer? So in CBS you will get hardly one to uh, one and a half minute time in one like uh, table. So you have to pick up the important clues from the question, the clinical weakness, what I shared with you, and with the the picture that would be shared. So any answer? Okay. Yeah, well, complete heart, complete heart block. Okay. And diagnosis? Uh, that is not a diagnosis. Diagnosis the same. And like, what is immediate treatment? We uh, anyway we have to start CPR because poor. No, sorry. Uh, we have to be first atropine and then pacing adrenaline, pacing. isoprenaline. Okay. So the answer is complete heart block. You are right. and the diagnosis would be post cardiac arrest arrest status complete heart block cardiogenic shock the patient okay. is in cardiogenic shock so this would be the complete diagnosis post cardiac arrest status complete heart block cardiogenic shock and the treatment that would be the immediate you would start with injection atropine maximum you would go up to 3 mg injection isoprenaline you can try you can try with injection adrenaline and then the final thing would be pacing that could be transvenous or transcutaneous so these would be the a b c answers you have to be short and crisp you cannot take much time because you have only one and half uh, one and half minutes to think about answer the question move to the next question because there would be around 10 to 12 question in each table so there would be three tables and you have to answer at least 25 questions out of 36 questions to get a sure shot like uh, like the passing in that cbs as a total so you have to pass in as a total the passing mark has to be more than what they have like uh, scored now the next question a 62 year old woman has been admitted to the icu 
with hypotension, bradycardia, following a four day diarrheal illness with vomiting. She is in acute renal failure with a serum potassium level of 6.9 millimole per liter. Normal range they have given here 3.5 to 5.3. Her medication history is unknown and his ECG is shown, which is just one second. Yeah. Now, what is happening here? What are the abnormalities in the ECG? First question. And the second question, what is the most likely cause of the bradycardia? It's like ventricular bisomy. Okay. What is the most likely cause of the bradycardia? Hypokalemia. Okay. Hypokalemia. There is a... Okay. Yeah. So, there are like uh, the answers would be ventricular bradycardia, atrial tachycardia, AV block, reverse tick, ST segment changes. And the question particularly wants to know that this patient is on digoxin. 62 year old man, hypotension bradycardia, 4 day diarrheal illness, now landed up in acute renal failure, potassium is uh, high. So, now this patient is, this, you can see the reverse uh, like STT changes tick sign in case of digoxin toxicity. So, the answer would be digoxin toxicity exacerbated by acute renal failure. So, you have to know what are the features of digoxin toxicity. Digoxin is notorious to have like all the like ECG changes. There are many ECG changes that would be seen in uh, digoxin toxicity. It's not only reverse tick ST segment changes. Rather, it would be a plethora of all the ECG changes that would be present. So, few more questions. If you would get a question about the digoxin, maybe in the CCS as well as CPS, what specific treatment is indicated? Digoxin specific antibody fragments. Now, what two type of or pieces of information that can help calculate the dose of or the D5? That is the patient weight and serum digoxin level. What would be like the other things that would be uh, like the adverse effects? with or following the use of digoxin specific antibody fragments, they could present with allergic reaction, hypokalemia, rebound toxicity with use of digoxin specific antibody fragments, heart failure, arrhythmias. Now, there could be a question, should digoxin label be monitored during or after treatment? No, because when you measure this, they would be like little bit of false because it would uh, like calculate both measure the both the antibody fragments that is bound to the digoxin as well as the free digoxin. So, it would overestimate the free digoxin level. So, rather you should not measure during the treatment or like after the treatment. Now, the next question, a 52 year old man has been brought to the emergency department having been found collapsed next to a canal. He is dressed in multiple layers of cold, wet and dirty clothing. He has a heart rate of 48 beats per minute, BP of 88 by 54 millimeter mercury. His GCS score is E2 M4 V3. Now, the paramedics have been unable to obtain a temperature reading and ECG done, showed. So, with this clue only, you are getting a hint that maybe the examiner wants to know about something related to cold. Cold, wet, dirty clothing, then unable to obtain a temperature reading and uh, found collapsed. So, the question here, yeah. So, this is the ECG. What are the abnormality marked by the arrows? So, they have made a very particular, like they have given a hint. What are these waves? And uh, the next question is other than hypothermia, what are the other causes for this type of waves? And what changes are made to the advanced cardiac life support algorithm when you researched a patient with hypothermia? The questions are like threefold. What is the abnormality? Then what are the other causes for this type of wave? And what are the changes that have been made? Any answers? J point elevation. Uh, and second, uh, it, second question. A second, other than hypothyroid can happen in the early depolarization and and a myocardial like a, 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 uh, STEMI and then LVH. Next third question. Changes made uh, army like along with the CPR algorithm, we have to continue with the active and passive warming of the patient. Okay, so the first question answer is Osborne J wave. 
other causes hypercalcemia brain injury subarachnoid hemorrhage vasus spastic angina idiopathic ventricular fibrillation type 1 brugada syndrome and normal variant which is like early repopulation then the question number uh, c the third answer are no adrenaline or other drugs until the patient temperature is more than 30 degree centigrade between 30 to 35 degree centigrade double the dose interval for the advanced life support drugs and then shock ventricular fibrillation up to three times if necessary then no further shocks until the temperature is more than 30 degrees centigrade so you have to aggressively increase the temperature at this point of time rather only giving the shock so these are the answers to the abc now moving further what is this device what is the purpose of this device how it can be classified and what are the indications for it use anybody Tandem heart, like this is a mechanical circulatory support and this is tandem heart. The purpose of this device is to unload or uh, unload the left ventricle and it is uh, comes under LVAD like uh, one, type 1, type 2, type 3. Indications for it. Okay, so uh, explaining further, it's a ventricular assist device, bad. And uh, the to, the indication is to partially support or entirely replace the function of left or right ventricle. This uh, part, uh, the C answer is, it can be divided into how it can be classified. It can be classified on the basis of ventricle being supported, whether it is left ventricle, right ventricle, or biventricle. Mechanism, that could be pulsatile, non-pulsatile. Location, extracorporeal, intracorporeal paracorporeal and the driving mechanism, whether it could be the pneumatic, electrical or magnetic. So on that basis, we can divide or classify the ventricular assist device. Now, the indications, the fourth question answer, again, you can divide into breeze to transplant, breeze to recovery or destination therapy. Breeze to transplant, implantation of the VAT to support the patient with end-stage heart failure who is waiting for the heart transplantation. Now, bridge to recovery is the implantation of the VAD to support the patient with a potentially reversible heart failure. So, once the heart has recovered sufficiently, you will be removing the VAD. Now, destination therapy, when uh, you are like the patient is not a candidate for heart transplantation, so you are implanting the VAD to support the patient with end-stage heart failure. So, uh, it's, it's like a portable VAD may be used in this situation. So that the patient may be discharged from the hospital and return home and spend the remaining life. So these are the indications of the VAD. Now, the next question, a 75-year-old patient with ischemic heart disease had been admitted to the hospital with uh, like the, uh, just one second, this is something. Now, a moderate, uh, uh, the transthoracic aid, Echo shows the moderate biventricular dysfunction and cardiac angiography demonstrates a chronically occluded right coronary artery with diffuse coronary disease. The drug history is bisoprolol, ramipril, spironolactone, and furosemide. A temporary pacing wear is inserted right now. So this is the question. With this question background, how could you describe the temporary pacing wears using the first three positions of the British Pacing and Electrophysiology Group Generic Pacemaker Code. This is the question number one. Then the second question, with reference to the pacemaker functionality, what do you mean by rate modulation? And the third question, what action should be taken when defibrillating a patient with permanent pacemaker? Any answer before I will explain? First three positions. Like the chamber paste, the the chamber and then the cham whether rate is inhibited or okay. increased. Okay. So it can be divided into two types. VBI, VOO. VBI is paced ventricle, sense ventricle and the I for inhibited if the native activity is sensed. So it's for demand pacing, VBI. Now VOO is for fixed asynchronous pacing. That means patient's ventricle is paced but there is no sensing. So this is OO. Now, 
The second one, what do you mean by rate modulation? The ability of the pacemaker to alter the rate based on the physiological demand. If the patient's demand is more, so if the pacemaker is able to alter the rate, so that means the pacemaker is able to modulate the rate. Now, the third one uh, for the permanent pacemaker, if you want to defibrillate, the defibrillator pads should be placed as far from the pacing box as possible. So this should be the point number one. And then post defibrillation, the pacemaker must be checked to check like whether the pacemaker settings and functionality is still ongoing or not. Or you have to like do something else to again uh, make it functional like before. So these are the two things you have to keep in mind when you are defibrillating a patient with permanent pacemaker. I'm not going into detail of the discussion because we are running out of time. Now the question number, next question is identify the abnormality and how will you manage this? This is very uh, clear image and the answers I have written. This is pericardial effusion or suspicious of tamponade because from this still image, it will be very difficult to answer whether the patient is in cardiac tamponade and without a significant or like a short case like Vignet. Little bit difficult, so we can answer in this way pericardial effusion, suspicious of tamponade, and uh, how do you manage depending upon the clinical scenario? Uh, but pericardiosynthesis would be my choice at this point of time. Now, a patient with triple vessel disease undergone CABG, post op patient is put on a mechanical circulatory assist device. Identify the device and identify the abnormality. I've answered it because we have already like gone through uh, this type of discussion. So IABP and IABP tip is displaced upward. Why I am saying that this IABP tip is displaced upward? How will you check the position on, in the chest X-ray? What will be the landmark? Anybody? It's about two yeah, centimeters. Yeah. yeah tell me. Two centimeters from the crime is a correct position on a chest X-ray. Right. And the IABP is inserted to the through the femoral artery advance until the distal tip is in the descending thoracic outer, preferably about 2 cm distal to the origin of the left subclavian artery. So that would be my uh, landmark to put the IABP successfully. And you can check it in the X-ray because the tip is always a radiopath marker. Yeah, you can see here, 2 cm from the carina IABP. And it should be 2 cm distal to the origin of the left subclavian artery. Just skipping. This is something we don't need right now. Yeah. 56 year male, chronic smoker with uncontrolled hypertension presented to the ER with acute onset chest pain radiating to the back. CT scan was done. Identify the abnormality. Manage. Answer. Management. Reduce the blood pressure, ABCDE approach, reduce the blood pressure and heart rate. First, the alpha blocker followed by beta blocker, SVP90, blood uh, or okay. 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 Next question. A 45 year male admitted to ER with acute onset chest pain and shortness of breath for six hours. ECG taken in ER. What is the diagnosis and what is the definitive management? Any answer? ST elevations in V1, V2, V3, sir, suggesting posterior wall MI. So, reciprocal changes in the V1, V2, V3. This is anterior yeah. wall MI. Right. And the definitive management is PCI. Okay. What pressure is the blue shaded area represent? And what is the mechanism of action of IV? Just the assisted, assisted diastolic pressure. Augmented, sorry, augmented diastolic. This is the area where like you know, the diastolic perfusion is improved coronaries. And uh, mechanism of action of IVP, it decreases the after load. That is the main mechanism of action of IVP. That's why the coronary perfusion improves, then the oxygen consumption decreases and uh, patients diastolic augmentation happens. This is one uh, drug. It inhibits phosphodiesterase 3 enzyme by decreasing the cyclic AMP hydrolysis. 
it works as an inodilator which drug we are talking about and what is its effect on the right side of the heart milrinogen okay and what is the effect on the right side of the heart improves the contractility okay. and improves artery function right and it's a pulmonary vasodilator reduce after load for the right heart and improves contractility of the right heart and it also reduces the preload to the right ventricle by peripheral vasodilator so it's a pulmonary vasodilator by that it reduces the after load for the right heart and peripheral vasodilator reduce the preload to the right heart. right so with this i end uh, the first 12 questions dr sanand any questions at this time dr ramanathan sir um, dr ram has to go he had a call uh, okay. from the hospital okay. no problem so dr sanand would you take no, i think uh, i think the main thing is in this cardiothoracic uh, domain is your clear concept about pacing and iabp so that you need to develop right now rather than leaving it for the exam so in the exam if you say oh before the exam i'll do it you will not be able to do it because this is a concept developing thing you practice the iabp curves you practice the pacing rhythms how how they look what is the abnormality regularly otherwise in the exam in the rush of a minute you will you will be you will be telling the wrong answer so the main thing why we have put it is to practice it go through multiple waveforms of that and make sure that you have a clear understanding right now rather than um just before the exam yeah so right, that is, yeah um i think you are done with you yes yes so i'll be we are going. almost two hours pass yeah rest seven. of the questions very quickly there is nothing um to describe in those questions so the um this was the bottles shown what is the mechanism of action of the drug and right to important side effects so protamine sulfate it's a cationic peptide that binds to either heparin or low molecular heparin from a stable and forms a stable ion pair which does not have anticoagulation activity so reversal Uh, the side effect are anaphylaxis pulmonary vasoconstriction bronchoconstriction people can have bron bradycardia it can ne negatively impact the platelet function there is interference the coagulation factor in decreased thrombin fibrin lysis someone was asking about the ratio the uh, aptem to heptem ratio so that is an important thing for protamine uh, excess so you look at the ratio and if the ratio is more than 1.25 we say it is sorry if the ratio is less than 0.9 we say it is a protamine excess so um we'll we'll go go through all these things uh, in a in a uh, structured class on rotem so uh, protamine you can get as a side effect as a mechanism of action and what is the effect on the rotem if there is a protamine excess uh 73 year old male to icu uh, came to icu post aortic valve replacement and one times cabbage his mediastinal drain continued to have a high drain output so bleeding his blood gas is as following you have asked uh, for a rotum which is again 20 minutes uh, it will take 20 minute to come back so what is the abnormality in the blood gas that you can optimize awaiting the rotum result and what is the mechanism of such disorder in post cardiac surgery so the abnormality here was a low level of ionized calcium which is an essential factor for coagulation so um, more of a vigilance question that you see a report and make sure that what does it mean in the context clinical context somebody is bleeding with a low calcium you need to supplement that uh, optimize the calcium is the answer and how the why the calcium level is low post bypass or post cardiac surgery it is because of multiple transfusion that causes chelation of the calcium uh, then again another rotum question the same patient has ever continued to bleed post optimization of hypocalcemia his rotum is attached what what is the defect you can see here so again you can see the fifth uh, mv5 is 5 which is just at the low level so not optimal for a cardiac surgery post post cardiac surgery patient who is bleeding probably will look for a higher a5 
So in my practice, I'll just correct the A5 or correct the fibrinogen deficiency to start with. Usually that fixes the whole coagulation cascade after that. So there is the, the thing that is abnormal here is the fibrinogen level, so it needs to be replaced. So uh, fibrinogen deficiency, either you give the fibrinogen concentrate or give cryoprecipitate. 70-year-old um, male presented with left-sided weakness of the body with right facial droop. He also has painful red raised lesion in the hand and feet as seen in the picture. Uh, which have been progressive for last three weeks, along with feeling unwell, low-grade fever, generalized malaise, and body ache. He has been treated with systemic prednisolone by the GP for last two months for polymyalgia rheumatica without much improvement. On occasion, he has a loud pansystolic murmur over the precordium. That's the picture. What is this? General lesion, sir. All right. So, what are the skin lesion consistent with and infective endocarditis? If it is painful, if it is painful, it is Osler. If it is not, then it is Janvis lesion, isn't it? Osler nodes are painful. Janvis lesions are non-painful. What are the other lesion that you can see in an infective endocarditis? In the eye, rot spots. You see that. Osler nodes are thought to be immunologically mediated, whereas the Janvis lesions are caused by septic microemboli, right? Bit of a medical medicine question. For the ever patient, what is the indication of urgent surgery and what is your empiric antibiotic plan? What is the indication for urgent surgery in infective endocarditis? Peri periannular abscess, block. Hmm? And if it is increasing in size, then we have to involve the, the cardiothoracic surgeons. No, this is so a very, very specific answer. This is a CBS question, very specific answer. There are four main indications up to date. So early surgery in infective endocarditis, if the patient has heart failure, uncontrolled infection, and prevention of embolization, if the patient has embolic episodes, right? So these are the main three indications. So heart failure, uncontrolled infection, prevention of embolization, such as neurological complication, if the patient has already a neurological complication, if there is a prosthetic heart valve, prosthetic um, valve infective endocarditis, then there is early surgery is indicated, right? So these are the indication, four more major indication. Heart failure or symptoms of uncontrolled heart failure, uncontrolled infection, still has blood culture positive in spite of a good trial of antibiotic, and if the patient has embolic episodes or if the patient has prosthetic valve endocarditis. Empiric antibiotic, benpen, leucloxacillin, gentamicin, plus or minus vancomycin, whatever you have, or depending on, this is the usual standard recommended medication, not to the Indian standard though. So you are appearing a European exam, so it will be Benpen, fluclox, gentamicin, plus or minus vancomycin, that's the ideal answer. But if you say we treat with meropenem, vancomycin and something else, in my practice, because you have to tell the reason, because of highly resistant organism is the most common organism, something which you have to give a rational explanation to the examiner. All right. Okay. Pacing abnormality demonstrated above rhythm, what will you do? So again, the temporary pacing. So it is not able to sense, is it, it is pacing everywhere. So it is pacing here, not able to sense the QRS complex, pacing here, not able to sense the QRS complex. So pacing irrespective of the QRS complex. So it is not able to sense. How do you treat? So make, make the sensitivity threshold or decrease the sensitivity threshold, okay? This is a reverse relationship. So if you dial up, then the sensitivity decreases. If you dial down, then the sensitivity increases, okay? Increases the, increase the uh, sensitivity threshold. That's how you treat. This one, uh, what is the pacing abnormality? Can anybody try that? Uh, following a uh, pacing, there is no... So uh, not able so to I capture. Yeah, no capture. So not able to capture. How do you do it? So increase the capture threshold. 
So if it is at 5 millivolt, then increase to 10 or 15 or 20, whatever. So increase it and see what is the response. Patient on VV ECMO, uh, ECMO for refractory hypoxia, comment on the color of ECMO blood in the circuit in below, depicted in images A, B, and C. All right. So normal dark color. So A is normal dark color blood in drainage cannula and red color blood in the return cannula. So that's the drainage side. So these are three different scenarios. Uh, this one is the drainage, that's the return, that's a VV ECMO, which is normal, right? So the drainage is darker than the uh, return, return is bright red, right? That is oxygenation is happening. What is the abnormality in figure B and figure C? What is it? B is oxygenator failure. Mm -hmm. And C right. is, is resuppression. Yeah. So if both are red, it is recirculation. If both are black or dark, it is hypoxia, oxygenator failure. Good. 79 year female presented to a general practitioner with chest discomfort and a flu like illness. Past history of included hypertension controlled with hydrochlorothiazide, captopril, and has vaginal thrush for which he, she is taking ketoconazole. She was also receiving digoxin 25 uh, milli, 0.25 milligram daily. Allergic rhinitis and flu-like illness was diagnosed and treated with a non-sedative antihistamine. So she then experiences a number of syncopal episodes and presented to the emergency. Clinical examination on clinical examination uh, shows she is well perfused, normotensive, but there are bursts of irregular pulse when present are present. So what is your diagnosis? Any comment on it? Polymorphic. IV magnesium treatment of choice. Okay. Four mm -hmm. year male, heart rate, no, HR uh, executive team investigation for insurance. And that's the ECG that is handed over to you. What is the diagnosis? I've gone. All right. So lead reversal, lead reversal, nothing to be done in this patient, right? So that's that's the problem. We know this ACG. Uh, you can, if I give you three minutes or four minutes, you can tell me the answer, but that has to be answered within one minute. So that should be a structure to approach the ACGs. I'll tell you quickly about it at the end, right? This one, 28 year male, known carcinoid syndrome, presented with vomiting, shortness of breath, tachycardia, palpitation. Multipara monitor revealed the following finding and intervention. ECG looks so fine. Is, yeah, pulmonary artery pressures and CVP is uh, raised with associated hypoxia, sir. And ETCO2 is also raised. Right? Yeah, so and yeah, CVP wave typically say uh, shows uh, row, uh, does, there is a yeah, carcinoid yeah, syndrome. Yes, mm -hmm. link the dot. So, carcinoid syndrome with a high CVP which looks abnormal, what it can be is right sided heart valve involvement with a TR. Sorry, oh. right? So, fusion of C and V wave, suggestive of TR associated with right sided carcinoid in heart. What will you do? 2D echo and surgical review. Okay. So carcinoid involves the right side of the heart. You'll have severe TR in that case. You may need to replace the tricuspid. Which of the following pulmonary artery catheter waveform represents the catheter's normal location? A is what? CV yeah, atrial B is right ventricle. Right ventricle. C is pulmonary. 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 D is pulmonary capillary. Which? Right? Which? So D. Which. Okay. Last one. 70 year female widowed presented with syncopal attack in emergency cardiogenic shock troponin positive. Angio normal. Provisional diagnosis. 70 year female widowed. Marcus. So these are all uh, important things to the stress cardiac. 
So diagnosis. If you diagnose, it should be ruled out. The ischemia should be ruled out, and heart failure management usual, right? I think that's pretty much. So I was talking about the ECG. Just go to in the exam quickly. If there is an ECG, how I approach is they should be ninety nine percent. They will be in this five pattern. Either it is a arrhythmia or periarrest rhythm or a heart block. The second is a ischemic rhythm. The third is a metabolic rhythm. The fourth is a temporary pacemaker rhythm. The fifth is a syndromic rhythm. These are the five rhythm I look for a ECG when I am given an ECG, right? Either it will be arrhythmia or periarrest rhythm, or it is there is ischemia there, or there is something metabolic thing that is causing that ECG, or there is a pacemaker rhythm, or there is a syndromic rhythm. Any syndrome, right? So you look at the ECG. For example, the one we saw, right? It looked normal. There is some STT changes, but it was not significant. So all the ECG will have a significant thing that is given to you. So that was not a ischemia, and that was regular heart rate, right? So I don't think that was fitting onto this ischemic rhythm. Yes, somebody said it was ischemia, but only T wave inversion. They will not give you in the exam as a T wave inversion as ischemia. Either it is a STEMI or a significant non-STEMI. Or a posterior wall or inferior wall MI that we get. So it is not a ischemic rhythm. Metabolic rhythm, yes, it can be. You don't know. But what are the metabolic rhythm? Hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, hypothermia, digoxin toxicity, and TCA toxicity. I don't think that rhythm was any of those, right? Because it didn't look like hyperkalemia. Didn't look like hypokalemia. The QT segment is okay. There was no reverse tick sign and TCA, no RVR or RSR pattern there. So I don't think it was a metabolic rhythm. Now temporary pacemaker, there was no pacing spike, so that was not the thing. So it can be something which is unusual, right? Either of these syndrome, right? Valence sign, no, it is not. Brugada, no, it is not. Short or long QT, it is not. WPW, no. Was there a S1 QT T3? No. Was there any alternate? Uh, large and small spikes like a pericardial effusion it is no what is left with probably a dextrocardia how do you look at a dextrocardia is it positive how do you look positive lead in avr no was it there no no have a look no no yeah should be negative. negative lead in avr it's a positive lead in avr that's a avr that's a positive yeah. lead so looks normal, no arrhythmia, no ischemia, no QT prolongation, no J wave. What is it? It is a, it is something which is abnormal, like a syndromic ECG. So no valence sign, no Brugada syndrome. Then the R A V R yes, it is dextrocardia. So that's how I look at the look at the ECG in the exam. I put those five things, and ninety nine percent ECG will be within that five things. You just try that method. If you think it is effective, then then continue with the exam, right? Otherwise, you develop your method of looking at the ECG to solve it within one minute. All right, that completes the session today. We are running over time, so I will not waste much time. It is already half past one here, so I will probably conclude the purpose. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Very well explained. So, any other questions we can discuss in our chat group, okay? Yeah. So, we can send uh, we in the questions in the chat I have uh, like almost 15 more slides, but I don't want to like uh, make it so exhaustive. Better you got an idea, an overview of like what are the questions normally asked. We were very thorough in the CCS. We have given you the domains which you can like you know, start building up your own question bank so that during the last one month time of your preparation, you will be just revising those questions and those like, you know, like clinical pearls. So try to have your own method of like uh, making the questions, scenarios, CPS, 
wherever you like see any type of like the monitoring like ecg or some atypical abg or something like uh, rotum some uh, like the take try to get all these things which are uh, available in the form the free or online materials and start making your own question bank otherwise in the last month there are people who ask what should we read so that is the question which we do not want from you all rather you should say that we have our own stock ready for the last month so don't take it the stock for other way it's the study stock okay so better like you get one idea and uh, start building up your own confidence by preparing all these questions that way so yeah. thank you everyone and Thanks, uh, first and i'll request the group to send any feedback that you want in the next class we'll try to incorporate that in the whatsapp group okay in the whatsapp group try to like uh, interact with other people who are also preparing for the edic part 2 as well as part 1 and make it so interactive that you can clarify your own doubts with your fellow colleague rather than only going through this text and the websites and like that. thank you everybody good night thank you for staying for almost more than 2 hours 2 and a half hours and thank you all the mentors Thank you, Dr. Sanand. Uh, we will be meeting you soon for the next domain. So the trauma and toxicity is coming up. That is again a very important domain. And believe me, that would be uh, the uh, something which you will be getting one CCS and multiple CVS questions for sure. And if anybody is interested in our course, please let us know. We would be definitely would be happy to help you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, Tapas. Thank you all. Good night. Record.